So typically, it's, uh, if we're going to have an open house Saturday, Sunday, it'll probably go live uh, about Wednesday online. Okay. And then Friday, um, Friday or Saturday morning, I'll probably get blasted out to the database. Okay. And, and so it's just an automatic shootout from the email from your admin there, or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay. Like it's all, all done through our CRM system, basically. And are you tracking attendance on that from the emails that go out, or are you just we are, so yeah. are tracking it? Well, yeah, yeah. Old, open rate, click rate, everything like that. Oh, perfect. Where, they, where do they go from the actual email? Yeah. On the website, everything. Yeah. Like that. The important part of things are important yeah. part of uh, uh, maintaining, knowing what you're doing, and getting that feedback loop. Yeah. Tara, yourself now, what are you doing? I'm mostly working on my sphere. Your sphere? sphere and um, I have a good connection with like a mock group. So okay. I go on and click, well, I can't say a lot, but okay. yeah, work from them. Okay. And you do, do you sit in the open house at all? Have you done any in the past? Uh, not in a while, but last okay. year I sat on a couple of them. Okay. It was quiet though. It was quiet. Yeah. yeah he, I used to be getting stuck with it. And I'd like to open houses. I'd like them because you never know who's coming in. But, uh, Hopefully by the end of the day, we're going to give you a few strategies to kind of figure out a bit better how to get more people in. A bit more than just, Alex, before you joined on, we said some folks can just enter into MLS for an open house. You can stick a sign outside the ground, a couple of direction signs. You may get traffic, you may not. Usually you do if people are out looking. You might get the odd person spill in, but there's way better ways of improving your odds of having good attendance. And I used to, <laughs> now, I'm not sure about the Oshawa market, but I can tell you here in Barrie, most people will show up. If you have an open house from one to three, if you don't get those signs in at the ground by three o'clock or three fifteen, you'll have people come until four or five o'clock because they always come at the end of it, right? Oh, I didn't notice the timings, but they don't really respect times. We see that more and more and more as the four hundred gets wider and wider. We see more and more folks showing up like disregarding the time. Right, so so be conscious of that and be be aware that uh, that you may need more time than you block off for those open houses. It happens. Brian, you're shaking your head. Yeah, been there. Been there. Yeah. It's tough sometimes. I say, I'm, I don't like to come in, but let me get my signs in, and then I'll open up. So I usually lock. We'll get my signs, and then open it up for that last straggler or something. Yeah, yeah. If the signs are still up, it's like your open signs still on, right? So they're coming. Yeah. To the <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Now, can you tell us a bit about yourself, about how long you've been in the business, and what are you doing? What have you done the last 24 hours in terms of lead gen, just to kind of to get in the game? Uh, well, I've just been in <clears throat> just been uh, in the industry for about three months now. It's not too long. Um, not too many open houses out this way at the moment. Uh, so, just been trying to work my sphere and get out and do doing some door knocking. Um, so I've just been preparing my, I just got my business cards in uh, about a month ago. So I've been out a few times uh, trying to find places with good turnover rates. Just I figured, you know, there's better chance of fish biting there than in lower turnover rates. Um, other than that, just, you know, trying to get my steps in to get, it, get out in front of people. Uh, awesome. Awesome. So, so yeah, it's three months is, 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 Sometimes a short period of time, and it can be at the same time a long period of time. It's like but, both. It feels like I haven't been in very long, but oh, there's so much to do. And uh, <laughs> well, I was mentioning earlier, I, I I'm coming up on or just over 20 years in the business, and I'm still learning stuff and still feeling like it's relaunching at times. Still feeling like that. What was I doing again? So it can be like that. It can be overwhelming. Yeah. Well, anyways, welcome again, and thanks for sharing that. So today we'll talk about open houses. We'll talk about some strategies. We'll talk about some ways to be successful and to hold a successful open house. The good news is I'll start off right off the bat by saying you don't have to have a listing to do an open house, right? A lot of times if you approach the big groups or if you approach anyone in your office that, 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 that they, they don't like a day off, you know, if, especially if you're working on a team and you've been working every Saturday and Sunday for two or three months, you approach the team lead and say, hey, look, I want to hold an open house. Can I hold it? Well, we're going to talk about, you know, doing that. And, and, Oftentimes they'll, they'll say, sure, you know, I want to give my team, I want to do some deep building with my team on this day and, you know, so then you want to talk about the types of home that you want. Can I have the next slide, please? Right there. Perfect. Thank you, um, Joby. Uh, so why do we hold open houses? What's the point of it? Lead generates one good reason. Yeah. Anything else? Any other reason? 
to sell a house. Yeah, those are the two main reasons that, that we have an open house in the first place. Now, a lot of sellers think, I don't want to hold an open house. I, I, you know, it's not encouraged. It's just for agents, to, new agents to get clients. And that may be part of it, right? But we want to convert anyone that comes into the open house. We want to convert them to a possible client. And we want to sell the house. So both those, both those answers are perfectly right. They're good. Okay, next slide, please, Joey. So you'll see a lot of the quotes here from from uh, U.S. I want to I want to start out by saying that the NAR statistics or National Association of Real Estate uh, Realtors in the in the states. A lot of the a lot of the material here is from that, and I can say this that a lot of the statistics are duplicated in Canada. They're very very similar. So when you're looking at sales, you're looking at buys. Our, our economies are quite the same in terms of size, but we do track and follow their trends very similar, similarly. Similarly? Similarly. I can't even say that word. So, so uh, if you see another statistic in that, be aware that they're, that they're pretty good. So Ron Cathell, he's down in Arlington, Virginia. He's built a big business, and it's a business of open houses. He, he, he treats them, there's a couple more that we'll hear about today, that they built their, they treat their open houses like a business, and they systematized everything. Okay, next slide, please. Um, you may have seen this one before. This is the pillars of, of how you're going to be successful in the business and why you're going to get better. Um, where we're at, you start out uh, by, by having a big why and building on that big why. And then, you know, of course, open houses are part of the lead generation pillar, right? Prospecting and networking. Um, you want to be, you want to list to last in this business. You may have heard that one before too. Folks, you need you need to have listings to last. The buyer the buyer pay paychecks too. Sometimes easier than a than a than a listing. Okay, thanks, Joey. Yep. So now a bit more from you guys. What what are you expecting out of today? Do you want besides a magic key and like and like and like four new clients to work with or five new clients to work with? Is there anything that you're looking for in the next in the next few minutes with me? Alex, why don't you go first if, if you have any ideas of what you're what you're gonna get? I think yeah, it's just um just some tips and tricks of uh, how to you know do open houses a little bit better. I'm still kind of new, so I'd like to hear from some uh, valued experience from our uh, from our leaders. Well, you're gonna get mine anyway. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> Thank you, Brian. Yourself? Well, I could echo what Alex just said. I mean the. The idea, um, you know, I've done quite a number of, of open houses. They only a couple of them have been my own. I've done them, you know, other other uh, agents in my in my brokerage. I've uh, offered up my services, and like you said, they wanted a Saturday afternoon off or a Sunday afternoon off, and and I, I've kind of, you know, put like you said, I put up the signs, and and I'm like, you know, I've done a little bit of uh, social media, um, you know. It, it, it ahead of time, but I, I'm still looking for more ideas on, you know, okay. if I do get, you know, a, 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 a fairly good turnout, how do I convert those people? Okay. What's, what's my way, you know, what's my best way to Perfect. convert them? Okay, thank you. Can we get help us handle that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Chris, along the same lines, is there anything else, anything different? You want ice cream phone at the end of this? No. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, yeah, very similar stuff. Yeah, just yeah, I was successfully from I am not from the open trip. Okay, okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get all that. That's great. Next slide, please, Joby. Well, they do work. We've touched on a few things, and we and I've got some experiences that that they they do work. Sometimes, sometimes you think that um, that it, you're wasting your time, and you're not. You don't sit in an open house really, right? You know, if we go there and it's cry about it, you get get things going. But let me tell you about an open house I did. Um, probably about 2016 or so, 2017. I was wearing two hats in those days. I was in the military and I was a realtor. Imagine that someone that wasn't a full-time realtor. I know it's hard to imagine. Um, sat at the open house, I picked up two buyer clients. I ended up selling the open house to one of them, so I double-ended it. And I got their listing, and then there was 
it, it just it was just a fantastic day to be out there and, and it was completely really unexpected because i wasn't doing any of the things we're going to talk about today i was that guy that put the sign in and, I, and in those days it wasn't it so it was uh, a previous iteration of that just put it on the system and away we went so it can happen and it's not just a gift from the real estate gods it's a, it's it, it, it it's a numbers game right people are looking right neighborhood right house so that's kind of important if you're going to do someone else's listing, you want to kind of pick. You want to kind of pick the house. You want you want it to be in one of those high turnovers areas, Alex. Right? You want it to be someone that's going to go. But even if they own the thing, can be good, right? Even one that's overpriced or that's been on the market for a long time, not in the best area, not in the best street, you can still stack the odds in your favor to get some traffic through there and to, and to have a good experience with that. So, in other words, don't say no to it. I mean. A lot of the hot listings in that some teams will save for themselves, right? Because that's how they grow their business. But don't say no to a, to a listing that may be a little bit stale. Okay, next slide, please, Joey. Um, so, yeah, so by, this, is, this is the numbers, again, it speaks, to, it speaks to how many buyers have to go through and what are the odds of getting um, a, a, an actual client from those buyers. So out of 100 buyers, they say 44 of them will visit an open house. Five of those buyers will use the agent from the open house, right? And then 39% of the buyers leave the home up unrepresented uh, by, by, the, by an actual agent or by another agent. One of the questions that you have to ask when someone, and we'll talk about this a bit more later on too, during the open house, is how do you kind of break the ice and get them talking? Because in my experience, when you're when you're at an open house and people come in, you get the ones that just want to look in and want to run in and run out. You don't really want to stay in your shields are way up here. And it's like, oh, they're just gonna you're like Bugs Bunny almost trying to stop, you know, the person running by, you know. So that's one type. The other type of person comes in and wants to talk, but has no interest in buying or selling anything. And you see a lonely old lady from down the street that's only oh, there's someone here to talk to. And the way they come in and you've got there goes two hours of your time. So how do you how do you sift through them? So anyways, those are the odds. So it doesn't mean to say you need to have that numbers of people come through every day, right? But a lot of the people I find come in, they are you working with an agent? Yes, I am. And then our inclination is to just let them go. But I've learned over the years there's more to it than, than that. Are you signed up with them? What's your relationship with the agent? What are their names? And if you ask what the agent's name is, maybe they know him, you know, maybe he's living around for a while and they go, no, 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 they can't remember their agent's name. Chances are they're not under contract with them, right? Then they become an opportunity. So, so these are things to kind of to kind of drill down and uh, we'll go over some of the questions and we'll even time allows we'll role play some of the things that we do to talk about, about how do you get to that level. Next slide, please, Joby. Okay, we've talked about that. I think we've been over that. Some of those things. It's just kind of, you know, what happens at an open house when we had an open house where something went on that you really liked. Next one, please. Yeah, and we're through that too. I think this is all still part of the intro. Yeah, we can keep going. See how fast we're going to be. I thought we had here for lunch. <laughs> Next, please. Alex, if I'm going too fast, slow me down. Okay. I used to have another line to that when I was back in the military days, but I won't say it here. Don't um, worry, you're good. Yeah. All right. So these are the these are the folks, the builder's wife team. I think you'll find that uh, throughout this presentation that they they host five or six open houses every Sunday. This is what I say they're treating like a business. They run they run an open house business. So they have a whole team, and, and this is not something for the newer folks that are leaving part of without deep pockets to pay that team to do it right you're not going to hire them to help you do your open houses well, we have another saying in the business saying that if if you're not an admin or if you don't have an admin then you are one so we've got to do all this stuff we've got to generate our you can get some cheaper flyers um, set up right and then you want to have something to hand out in other words what i'm saying when someone comes into your open house you want to have not necessarily a stack of stuff there for them to just grab. You want to have something there to give them so that then you can then ask them for something. They're more likely or more inclined to say yes. 
right? If, if you're just asking for someone, they, they, you know, they'll find a reason why not to, right? But if you can give them something first, like the market report of the area or the homes that are, that are sold in the area, something they don't have really at their fingers, they're more inclined to say, well, yeah, okay, you can put me down on an email list or you can, you know, you can send me stuff, right? It's all about getting to know what they're looking for. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so so if you don't have a strategy or a plan, then then your open houses will take anywhere the wind is blowing. So I guess in the preparation phase, you want to determine what's going to make a good open house. Well, how am I going to judge if this is a good open house or not? Is it going to be the number of people through the number of clients I get, the contacts? Is it going to be a good experience for those folks that come in? Is it going to be people I can add to my database and then follow up with them? Right, so so depending on the market, you know, one and the house itself, one person coming through might be might be a success. Right, you want to determine that before you actually, before, you know, so that you have an idea of whether it's good or bad. Right, uh, we'll talk about the things to do to get as many people there as possible. Weekend, you can do weekends as well. I saw. Recently, I've seen evening open houses creeping into the marketplace. I've seen middle of the day. I've seen wine and cheese creeping in on some of the higher end homes out in the Collingwood area. You know, I've seen you start to see people trying different things. Seven p.m. You got an early evening one. I used to do something called a preemptive open house, like door knock neighborhood that I was doing, that I was getting a listing at. I would invite the neighbors in for a pre, like, a, and I'd give them a, um, a pass card. Or a passport, and I'd say you can come in. You're invited to a pre-open house. So again, it's nothing important with the sellers. Be careful with the repo laws, right? If you're serving alcohol or something, if you're having a wine and cheese, it can get a little dicey. And you always watch for that person that wants the fifth and sixth glass of wine that drops in. You kind of got to be careful with that. There's a bunch of other considerations that we'll go over as well. Again, if you're holding, if you're if you if you're a single agent, team up with a couple of other single agents and coordinate an open house so that you're not alone in it. And that's important. Another thing that we'll have to talk about is is that safety, right? For men and for women, uh, things are you know how do you screen your people before they come in the house? Kind of make sure it's not someone trying to rob the rob the seller. Okay, next slide, please, Joseph. Joby, names today must be Wednesday. My well, must be first day back off vacation or something. Thing. Uh, okay, so prepare and promote your, your open house. Pre preparation is really twofold. You want to prepare the house and you want to prepare yourself. People are going to ask, well, what did the house down the street sell for last week? You got to know that stuff, guys. Take, a, take a, more than a few moments. Take some time to prepare the statistics. Know what's out there. Know when, when the neighbor sold. If the next door neighbor sold last year or the year before, you got to know about it. Because that's how that's how the the, uh, the general public's going to determine whether or not you know what you're talking about. So, and it doesn't take long. You look at the statistics. How, you've got to know how many bedrooms there are in the house. You got to know what's finished, what's been done, how old the roof is, how old the windows are. It's okay not to know everything. To have a few times, a few questions. So you know what? I really don't know that. But if you say that after every second question, you're going to lose credibility. Right, and then the, then they'll just be nice and they'll talk and they'll say okay, and they'll take your business card and then they'll they, it won't make their pocket before they're at the end of the walkway. They're gonna, the business card will get lost and you'll never hear from them again. That will be the end of it. So take some time, do that research. How much research do you do? Well, that depends on on the area that you're hosting, right? Where you're the, the type of house that you're in. If it's a subdivision home, you want to know you want to know the numbers, average sale time. What the price is, what the what the what the average sale price has been, um, what, what the affordability index is, who, what type of people are moving there. It, I mean, it can get you can go down, you can drill down as deep as you want to, and the real answer is somewhere where you're comfortable at. Some folks are, are meticulous about wanting to know everything, but if you wait to study everything, the open house date time will will roll past, and you'll still be studying the neighborhood to try and get it. So you have to you have to kind of draw your line in the sand and say, okay. Now I'm at a comfortable level where I've got the basic questions answered. So I know the home, I know the age of the roof, the windows, I know if the basement's been finished, I know if there's been any problems with it. 
you know, do you disclose that? Not really, because you're representing the seller, right? And so there's certain things you you, you don't do with it with a, in an open house environment. One of them is coach the buyers too much. Then you start to enter into a client relationship. And that's probably one of the things really don't really know about is this inadvertent client relationship, right? They set something up and they could be with someone else. So you can't really, does it happen? It probably happens a lot. I'm sure it happens. But, it, and if you know about it, that's one thing. But if you're not sure about it or you don't know about it, sometimes those things can bite you, bite you as well. So be careful about providing advice to them. Um, okay, next slide, please. Yeah, prepare and promote. So we talked about preparing for the house itself. Know a little bit about your sellers, but you don't want to give too much away, right? Like if they were that couple that had the argument that are divorced, and you don't want to tell that to a potential buyer, you can't. You're representing the seller. Um, so when you're talking about prepare, preparing the house itself, you want to talk to your sellers, and, you, and one one idea is to get them to walk outside and walk back in and pretend this is the first time. And say, how would you feel if this was an open house if you're doing it? And they say, well, I love all that stuff there. I love the 50 million jackets hanging in the end of the way. <laughs> you know, I, I love the dirty steps that we trip over everything. So, again, it's 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 taking it with taking them through it and putting them in the buyer's in the buyer's shoes, right? Um, other things, other things you can do to talk about a seller that. A seller that maybe doesn't want to have an open house, right? You got you got to promote the, the reasons why it's a good idea because it's marketing and it's visibility and it's getting people through. And oftentimes I've used I've used the line that says, you know, we don't know. Maybe a neighbor wants to have a family member move close here, short of knocking on every door in the area, so knocking on five hundred doors in the area to find out. We won't know that until we hold the open house and get people through this. I've seen it sell too. I've seen houses like that sell from someone like that. They want to be here. They're aging parents, right? They were two doors down. I guess I'm just going to add that it gets a little more tricky if you're a, a, a newer agent and it's not your listing and you're working with with another agent's client. So right. for them, you kind of right. You Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You, yeah, you have to be careful. So, so you want to hope if it is not your listing that you that that that, that person will set them up for that. Hey, if they're scheduled an open house there, they may have covered some of that ground already. Or they may not have. Or they may not have, which is which is equally dangerous, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So in either case, you're gonna still need to know the details and statistics from the area. And the more you know, the better. The schools, the the outdoor pools this time of year, where's the outdoor pool at? You hear all the kids cr you know, screaming, hey, railway trains, right? Where's the tracks? How close are the tracks? Do you hear the tracks? Right? These types of things will make you um, more likely to be perceived as the local area expert, which is what our goal is. Is, is and, again, and you got to get their shields down first to listen to those uh, people coming into the open house. Once their shields are down, this is where the good communication starts to happen, right? So, so it becomes listening and 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 responding to their language, their body language, what they're what they're asking, what they're looking for. And uh, again, we'll talk a bit more about that when we get to the drink. Building relationships there. Point number four, I can't, I can't overstate that. Because guys, we're not in the sales business. We're not sales people, right? We're relationship builders. We're relationship people. People don't do business with people they don't like and they don't know. And so the trick really is how do we get a conversation? We have about five minutes, right? In an open house, three to five minutes, someone coming in, do you jump them when they come in the door? Do you let them come in? Do you let them get a sense of what the house looks like and then ask them for something? Or then start to talk to them? Right? There's a, there's a, everyone is different and you'll, you'll read the, you get better at reading those people. So you want to pick up on those clues. Usually they come in, husband and wife will come in. You learn pretty quick which one you want to talk to, right? One of them, one, but the one that's quiet sitting back might be the decision maker. So you really, you really have to you know, talk to both of them. And get both of them engaged and switched on and figuring out what who's in charge and how best to approach them. And it varies from one to the other to the other. You know, now, I don't know if, if you've been in an open house where there's 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 three or four people in at the same time. And you gotta how do you watch all them when you're by yourself? How do you watch all them at the same time? Right? Like like some people control it, 
I've seen some folks, especially during, well, COVID, it wasn't many, right? It was virtual, but how was the whole, so you were hosting them online. But I mean, I, you know, some folks, you just say one at a time, please, because I have to keep an eye on folks, and they understand it. You know, unless it's pouring or snowing outside or something like that, or it's pouring rain, they get it, and they might leave. But you know what? You, you're, again, you're protecting the seller. Whether it's your listing or not, you're protecting the seller and the seller's properties. Okay, and the be safe point there, uh, point number six, you should let your office know that you're doing an open house. Now, male or female, now, there's no difference anymore in there, right? Because uh, let's face it, there's a criminal element out there that loves open houses. That's an opportunity for them to come in and scope things out. So back in the day, a couple of years ago, they, they started asking for driver's licenses in Toronto. They wanted to see proof of ID and they were tracking, they weren't writing down numbers or anything or taking pictures of it, but they wanted proof of identification. And, and you get a sense of that. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you don't know who's coming in to scope out the place to see if they can come back later. So be safe, let someone know where you're at, what you're doing it. Yes, it's online and yes, it's advertised, but I would tell the office too, like I'm doing an open house here. If you're getting signs from the office, if you don't have your own signs yet and you're borrowing them, then the office staff knows, just tell them where you're going. Say, yeah, I'm doing an open house at one Disney Main Street or something, two to four, I should be back here around 4 30, so we'll drop them off. That way they know, right? And it sounds, it's, and I know we're up in Canada and, and you know, that doesn't happen up here, but it does happen up here. So, and you don't have to be in Toronto, or you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be in, in a big city for it to happen, for something untoward to happen. It's best if it's busy in a busy hot market, like a spring market, you want to pair up anyways, right? That way there you can watch each other's back. Okay, next slide, please. So the goals we got, the number of leads, we talk about that. And that's something from experience as well, right? Like you can start out with five, start out with a basic number. If I get, like for me, if I get five leads from an open house, I'm doing good. That was, a, that was an excellent open house. If I get five people in the summer, it has to be an excellent open house. I have five people come in. And try and resist the urge to hug the person if it's right near the end of your open house time and thank you for not skunking you. <laughs> I've done that too, where I'm just so happy to see someone come in. And you know, it's like even if it's the sound is coming back. Um, but yeah, knowing your numbers is really good. You want to you want to be able to add to your database because this is what it's all about. I'll speak back to relationship building again. And this is what it's about. It's, it's knowing your numbers, knowing that you're moving forward. Whether you're new in the business or you've been around for a few years, you want to know numbers of buyers, numbers of sellers you're getting. Um, and again, if you put invitations out, if you're getting fancy and you're door knocking the area, then then you want to track how many and how many invitations went out versus how many people came. And if you can, follow up and say, hey, how come you didn't come? Like if you if you go door knock again after the open house, you know, with the next time around, maybe say, no, she missed my last one. Was it something I said or just didn't want to go? Or you know, and you keep I keep it light. And you might notice that I, I joke around a bit. And then, yeah, so for open houses themselves, how many are you going to do? Are you going to do them every weekend for six months? Are you going to do them? Are you going to do them every second month, maybe? You're going to do, you know, every week you want to do one? It's all about how you structure your time. We don't have to work Monday to Friday here. We do. We work any day that ends in a Y because we're realtors and because that's the way we've been programmed to think that we have to answer that call or we have to pick up, we have, you know, we have to answer that email or we have to jump on it when our clients want. I think that's another session, but truth be told, we program our clients how to deal with us. And if I don't answer the phone after 8 p.m., my clients will know that, and they will not expect a response at 801, because Dan does. Dan hangs up the phone at 7:59, and he won't pick it up again until 9 a.m. the following morning, unless it's urgent and they have to get a hold of me. Right. So we are telling our clients how to deal with us all the time, all the time. Okay, next slide, please, Joby. Touched on this a bit earlier, right? Which which houses do we hold open? Well, if you don't have a listing, it becomes, you know, you can't be beg beggars, can't be choosers. So we can't just, you know, take the best listings all the time. Because in a good market, if it's properly priced, it's gone, right? If it's in a good area and it's properly priced and it's properly marketed, you're not going to have time for those to open houses. 
And in my experience, most sellers, if they sell conditionally, that's it, we're done. I don't care if there's a home inspector required or if there were, there's no more showings, no more open houses. And we get that in our system, right? We get the NDCS continued showings or we get the no more showings. So you can look at that and you can see, but if a home goes conditional, I mean, to what Chris spoke to earlier about listing it Wednesday or so, or getting invitations out Wednesday or so, if, if you're getting a listing up Wednesday, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to hold it open for Saturday, Sunday, because I want those folks from Toronto to come up and have a look at it. So I'm going to schedule that open house. I'm going to schedule at least, I'm going to try at least market for a full week, 10 days is better, because that allows people with the money to buy it, even in a good market. Even in a good market, then if you get a if you get one of those wacky preemptive offers, zero to two hundred k over ask, then you can talk to your seller. You have a great conversation with your seller. Then you say, "Mister, Mister Seller, by the way, we got one, we might not want to hold the open house this uh, this weekend." All right. So special features on the house part that speaks to your preparation, right? You want to know what's good? Very. I think Ontario is a desirable neighborhood. If you look worldwide now, I and mean, if you look even countrywide, you see Florida fires out west, you see, you see smoke and haze and pollution down south. I think all of Ontario pretty much captures the desirable neighborhood of that aspect of things. So we don't have to push that as much. Although truth be told, there's an exodus out of Ontario to the Maritimes and you know to, to Newfoundland where it's more affordable. Yep. So, so, right? Calgary. Calgary, yeah, the Calgary is another one that's undervalued, right? Edmonton, you can get a nice place now at the West. Well, Alberta doesn't have um, what do you want to ask? Yeah. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. You're right, they don't. Never mind two of them. Yeah. Go to Toronto, okay. right? Yeah. 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 So, so, so again, is it a desirable neighborhood? No, it speaks to being prepared and knowing, knowing what the house you're going to set. Now, what do you do if it's a last minute house then? What if someone calls you up and they say, hey, can you sit this, can you sit this out for me? Do you say no to it, Alex? A last minute, you get a phone call saying, Alex, can you do an open house for me tomorrow afternoon? No, you always say yes, as long as you're able to, of course. But yeah, you yeah. always want the opportunities. Yeah. Right, and then you do what you can, right? You allocate some time to do some research to pick off the big things, the big points that we mentioned, right? Like what's the affordable, how much down pay you're going to need to buy this house? Well, if it's listed at 500,000, you need 5% down, right? That's 25,000. That's pretty basic math, but you get the idea. You know, what's the, you, you, you do the neighborhood, you look at the house itself first, then you start branching out to the neighborhood. Because that's the most important thing is that you should know that the house you're in, how is the furnace? You know, when is the water tank rental? Is the water tank a rental? These are the types of things that you wanted, that you want to pick up and absorb. And you can do that in a short period of time, even if it's like the same day. You know, I'm not going to say no. If it's if I had the time available and someone asked me to do something for him, I'm not going to say no. But I want to set myself up for success, and I want to do the best I can to at least have a good experience. And you can even research it while you're there, right? Your hotspot on your phone. That starts to get a little again. You start, you know, adding cost up in that. But really, if I'm going to sit there anyway, so I'll, maybe I'll call my sphere up and I'll invite them by. And I, you know, I got I got stuck doing this open house here. Fred, you want to come by and you want to want to come by and have a look? Uh, I know they're in the market for one, right? So it's again, it's an opportunity. Next slide, please. So again, speaking to preparing the house, you want to you want to want to get the house the best it can show. You're not doing the seller any favors if you can't. And again, it speaks more to your. Your listing right there is more of it's your own. Mm -hmm. um, curb appeal. I mean, was it Jim Wright just listed a place on Coughlin here, one of the agents in our office? And he, uh, I saw it on the grass. He was on social media and he had it. You see that his Instagram post? No. Yeah, he said, I'm out there. He said, This is what we do to prepare our clients' house. We got them all along. I'm going, Well, you better die, You know, but, uh, but there he was. And then the house is sold now. So whether it's whether he's getting ready for an open house or just looking after for a client, these are things you can do to help the house stand out. Yeah, I right? just jumped the snow. I had a vacant property. You're good. Yeah, I've done that too. I brought my son out. Too. Yeah, it's amazing. You haven't been here not long enough in the business yet, but done something like that or had it, Chris? Uh, no, I've shown snow before. And, uh, one of your yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, pre-construction uh, pre or one of that one of the new homes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Nice. We up on a mat, so like it was bigger for landing snowy boots and everything too. Nice. And you need to know what your clients want, right? With your sellers can and can't be maybe it's an elderly couple. Maybe you're gonna help them out. You just go that extra mile, you do that extra bit of relationship building. It goes a long way. Because who are they gonna think of when someone else comes up with real estate? They're gonna who are they gonna think about? They're gonna say, oh, you know, I kind of shot my shit shot my driveway. Like two feet of snow in there, she prepped it. Um, sellers open house checklist. So checklists are good. And my old military van here is going out. Checklists are great because you know because you don't forget stuff. And my mother used to box my ears for that too. Did you write it down? Did you make a list? Did you forget something? Oh, you poor boy. Did you have it written down? No. No, I didn't. Okay, next uh, next slide, please. All right. So okay, so now preparing for an open house. Why don't we write down questions that we'd ask people? What, Brian, what do you ask folks when they come in the open house? What's, what's, how's it work? Um, well, I, I, I tried various different things. And one thing that I found that kind of works because it, it takes them a little bit off, puts them a little bit off guard. I, I, I congratulate them when they come in the house. <laughs> oh, nice. And they'll say, well, when you congratulate, you obviously sold your house. So, you know, now you're looking at <laughs> something to do. That's beautiful. Oh, I haven't sold the house yet. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, don't be a dumb question. I love it. I love it. Barry, do you have one that works? Oh, no, I really haven't. No? Barry, again? Or? Yeah. Do, do you wait for them to ask you something? Or? Uh, usually I'll just, I'm one of those people, I, I'm always, me personally, I've always either one of the people like attack you as soon as you come in through the door, right? So just let them come in. Hi, how are you? Sign in me a second kind of thing. Please look around and hear if you have questions and then okay. sort of like float around and be like, oh, did you know this? Whatever. Nice. Yeah, but are you yeah. listening to what they're talking about? Close, trying, close enough to pick up something? Yeah, without being pretty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to yourself, Chris? Uh, I just asked, uh, what, what rooms you have today? What are you looking for? Okay. Just because if we have another property that maybe this, the one in the open house that I've had brought them to, but it might be a 50 50 shot. We might have something else to accommodate. Or you can just say, you know what, we don't, we don't have any of that, but we can certainly say, you know, one of the VIP buyers, sir, that we can get you looking at properties like that. And we can go take a look at them. Okay. So it has, it's actually got the two clients that way that are, we've currently taken a look at some other properties. So, okay. Love it. I love it. I love what Tara said. I like what you said. Dude, I love that assumption, folks. So yes, congratulations. It's beautiful. <laughs> Alex, do you have you done open houses? Have you or tell me about what you say when you're door knocking? Maybe it's the same type of thing, right? Well, well yeah. different. Yeah, but but uh, no, I haven't done any open houses yet. But when I go over and do my door knocking, I'll go and say, "Oh, I'll just um, I'll just say, oh, I've noticed. Hi, I'll, just, I'll introduce myself. Hi, I'm Alex Schaub. Hi, I'm Keller Williams Energy. I've noticed that there's oh, there's been a lot of home sales in the area recently, and I'm just here to answer any questions you may have about real estate. And then I wait and I listen, and you know, answer nice. any questions they have. Yeah, nice. And you find out pretty quick whether they're receptive at the door or whether they're not, right? <laughs> you sure? They're at an open house because they're there for one or two reasons, right? Yeah, they're it's a little bit more of a hotter, uh, hotter quality. Could be a little warmer, yeah, yeah. Could be a little warmer. At least then you know they're interested in something. Yeah. So I'm kind of, I love, I love, I love what I hear from Brian. I might, I might use that if you don't mind. But I have another technique I use, and it's somewhere in between. Shoppers in the room will know this right away. When you walk into a store looking for something and a salesman jumps on top of you right away, you're not ready yet to answer their questions. It's the same with a with a with an open house. If you go too early, they're going, they're going to look at don't bother me now. I don't know. I'm just looking, I'm just browsing. We're just browsing. You'll hear that a lot. We're just we're just out here looking and and so if you wait too long, of course, and then they're out the door and say, just a minute, can you you know, and then they're gone. So the trick I find is, is to break the ice when they come in, say hello, greet them, always shake their hand and greet them if, you know, unless it's COVID and they're kind of sketchy and they're wearing masks and stuff. It's, it's their comfort level. You don't want to be too imposing. But I usually do this when someone comes in. I'll give them a couple of seconds to get in and look around. And then I'll say, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, get their names or whatever. You can say, Look, look, I, I got to ask a question. I said, before you get going on the house, I said, people come into an open house for one or two reasons. 
they're either looking to sell their home and they want to see what the value is of their house or they're looking to buy a house may i just ask which 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 side you fall into right are you, are you a buyer looking to buy or are you a seller looking to, to get a valuation and then i leave them alone right so it's a really quick question and then kind of step back and do what Tara does and kind of listen for them and listen for them to, to pick up on something and it's hard for me not to be creepy that's just that's just the way i come across sometimes i kind of you know but i but i but because I, I want to watch because I, I worry about things going missing and i want to make sure that i want to make sure that i bond with them i'm a high gemini i'm a high eye so i have to talk to people i have to feel like i'm doing a good job otherwise it's a bad experience and so that's why when i say thank you for not skunking me i really mean it i really mean thank you for not you know you're the first people through it's a tendency to open the open house thank you thank you thank you for coming in i really love it <laughs> excuse me so we've heard does anyone here heard about open questions and closed questions right you ask you ask an open question and that's that doesn't give them a yes or no answer it allow it makes someone think about something and come up so that's what kind of what we want to do but if you ask them that right when they come in the door they're likely to just so i don't know the shields are going to stay up right they're not going to come down so give an opportunity to get to so that you're not in their face or in their space but at the same time you got to greet them and let them know that you're there and let them know that you're wanting to to know that because you got to figure that some of these people have been looking for months especially in the market where they were done affordability newer buyers younger folks like, man, looking for, how long are you looking for? Like six months, eight months, really? Doesn't sound like it's working too well for you. You know, are you working with someone? And then one of our questions has to be, are you signed up with another realtor? Or are you are you are you working with a realtor already? And if they say yes too fast, then just ask them, oh yeah, who is it? Maybe I know one. Right? And if they struggle with the name, they're not working that closely with them. It's not like their brother or uncle or family or something. Right, and we'll talk about some of those things. But the open-ended questions, get them to talk about why they're there. I think because folks love to talk about why they're there. Is it just the two of you? Do you have little ones? Like sometimes they'll bring them through the open house, and those are the ones you really gotta watch like a hawk because things disappear with little ones, not at eye level, but at their at the kid's eye level. Anything shiny, anything shiny is gone. You see, wasn't there, wasn't there the toy truck here when I got here? And you're kind of going, uh oh, and then you got an answer to sell it. So yeah, so what other what questions, what other questions you ask? Once you reach that point where you're getting engaged, what other types of questions do you ask? Um, uh, yeah, I just go basically what type of square footage you're looking for. Is there a certain price point that you're trying to stay within? And then obviously location is a good location for you. What do you think of the well, yeah, I'm that specific. So, go, what do you think of the price point that we're currently at? What about the location? And then they go, Yeah, the location's great. And then I kind of expand on what the location offers, whether it's a ghost station, direct access to the 400, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it's tough to say off the like right now, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not in that conversation. It's kind of close, but yeah, those are typically the questions that go like price point, square footage, um, and then the outcome is just about folks who have the property. You felt Frank, you have anything yeah, besides besides congratulations, which I really love? Well, I, I mean, some of the things that I would ask are, you know, what's drawn you to this particular neighborhood? You know, is there something special about this neighborhood that maybe you're attracted to? Um, when are you thinking of making a move? You know, is this something that is imminent, or are you are you just kind of shopping around? Nice. So you're pre-qualifying them in your mind, right, as to as to their level of urgency, which is great. Which is great. I also asked them, uh, like, hey, it's just them and that. What drew them? How does the house compare to that? Well, I mean, way out. Like, if they haven't really been open, hey, can I ask you? Because you know they're going to more than one open house, right? So I, how do they compare to other houses you've seen out there? Right, and a way that you can know what the answer is before you ask them, which is really great. If, if you already know the answer, then, then then you can focus on how they're answering. Right, so you preview open houses. As an agent, you're fine to go to an open house without a client. You know, it's a habit to get into. If you if you're not real busy and you don't have a lot of stuff going on, hey, I'm going to block off a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. I'm going to go to someone. I'm going to go to I'm going to go to a competitor's open house. I'm going to introduce myself. Right. 
Why, why wouldn't you? Because, you know, you might do a deal with them someday. You might be sitting across the table. Isn't it nice to know who you're dealing with? So you go there and you, and you, and you, and we can snoop and we can see what they're doing at their open house. Who's got the best cookies? We can see who's got the best pop or the best coffee out there if they're hosting them. And you can see the ones that are like asleep on the couch, you know, with the hole in their sock that they get their feet up on the couch and they're out like a light. I've done that. I've done it in the house and I've seen really like that. Like it's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah, totally, totally oblivious. They don't care. They're just sitting there. They're just, they're just getting everything on the house. They, just, they don't get it, right? They don't know what the potential is out there, right? Great question. Great. I love it. I love it. And you're right. Everyone's different. Every Everyone that walks through the door is almost different, right? Okay, next slide, please, Joby. So this speaks again to preparation, right? We're still on the before part of it. It still speaks to how are you going to to ask questions? Are well, you going to know the question? You're going to write them all down before. Um, information packet. That's something again. It could be more high cost, right? Do people use high? They sign in with a with a with a hard copy sheet now, like a paper, so, or do you have iPads? Do you have your iPads right now? Nice, nice, right? And do you sign in for them, Brian? Or do you get them to actually? No, I get them. You get them to write it in. You get any Mickey Mouse's or Donald Ducks no. or anything like that? No, good. Because they're relaxed by then and they're pretty. They're pretty good. Want to try QR codes? Because then oh, that's like yeah. at least it's like legit, right? Because they yeah. have to like put in real information for. Well, yeah. I guess to some extent, but it has to be a valid. Sure. For it to sure. That's great. You try that door knocking, Alex. Do you try QR codes or whatnot? Then they just hit it and and you capture their information, right? I like that part. Once I get set up, uh, we uh, we talked about it over in uh, the Oshawa office a few weeks ago. I'm definitely looking into it. Okay, good. So, and also another one with QR codes too is another one that I haven't yet done. What I would like to do is have a QR code that oh, if this house doesn't interest you, here's some other ones that are on the record that are similar. That you know, if you have a look, you can go take a look. Tomorrow or later on after this afternoon. Or, yeah, it's you know, quick. Check out these ones. Yeah, you know, nice. well, I find, <laughs> as I get older, everyone else is getting younger than me, and I find that some folks love the QR code, right? Like the younger generation for sure. Like it, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm even struggling because I'm, I was like half in between, like when the internet was kind of coming out, right? So I'm still old school writing book, you know, whatever. But like, so it's. Yeah, it's, like, it's been a game changer. Typically, I'm a pen and paper guy. Typically, I like to write it down and then I can look at it and I carry it around different rooms, but I'm learning to use a smartphone more. Okay. So, information packets are so that's a great idea. That you are. I love it. And I'm sure if you talk to Carlos on the tech, uh, tech yeah. Tuesdays or tech yeah. afternoon, he'd probably be able to set you on the right path. We have a tech guy that we do three, you know, their dropping sessions, I guess, from two to three. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, maybe four days out of the week. And yeah, you can just you hop on there because we have a whole system, right? Our command. Are you into command, Alex? Yeah. 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 I think we're on mute there. Yeah. So so command is basically it's just our, our data management system, right? And rather than top producer or something else that's that's an expense, it's all packaged up in in our in our monthly fees. Yeah, so, but again, I just hit scratch the surface of it. There's so much to it. So much to it. It's scary. Um, okay, next slide, please, Joby. Well, I think we've pretty much beaten this. They prepared. We've got the house down prepared. We talked to the seller a bit. What do buyers want to know? We touched on that. What do sellers want to know? So that's something we haven't really hit on. What about a local seller that comes into your open house? What kinds of things do you think they'd want to know? They can't get that they can't get from like how Sigma or something. And I say how Sigma, it's just a convenient app, right? So, from my experience, a lot of times the sellers will go, Why are they selling? Even local sellers will want them, they're nosy neighbors, right? They want to know, and, and they, they, they want, they, maybe the sellers are more private, they want to help. You know, maybe their family's moving up north, or maybe they're, you know, whatever. So you want to square that away, even if it's a short notice open house, you want to square that away because with the agent, the client, uh, who's, who's listening it is, say, tell me a bit more about the seller, right? You know, what, what are they comfortable with? What are they not comfortable with? That's something that I would like to know because 
again, my nature is I want to talk. Yeah. I want to talk and I want to get them talking. And if I can tell them, if I know something that makes me seem smart, I'm going to tell them. And so, but I'm going to be careful about what we tell them. Right? That's my, you know, they say that uh, weakness is really no gun strength. So sometimes we have to remember that things that make us good and make us strong, sometimes if we overdo it, we have to take, take it down until it's back a notch. How would you say, though, like, so they do ask, well, like, why are the sellers moving? And they specifically said, you don't want anybody to know why we're moving. Like, how do you? I could say that to them. It depends on the person, right? I say, I don't know. So maybe they're maybe just getting older and it's time to move on or house not working or something, something generic. Or if it's if it's not your listing, I would just refer them to the listing agent. Yeah. You right. should ask. Oh, yeah. that's a great idea too. That's great. Yeah. If, if you don't know, tell them you don't know and then refer them to someone who does know. You know. So what else do they want to know besides why the seller is moving? How much is the house for? You gotta know that. That's all basic stuff, right? What do the neighbors sell for? They're gonna to wanna to know that if they don't know already. And it depends, right? If they're an older, older couple coming through, you know, they maybe they don't have access to QR code readers or or or, or smartphones, or there's still those dinosaurs out there that, that it is not effort with the social media or the with, with technology. So they 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 don't have an app, they don't have it readily available. Although I have to say, it hasn't really hurt us. The US has been given sale prices for 10 years now. We're starting to realtor.ca, you know, the Scotia announced about, about two or three weeks ago that they're going to be posting sold prices on homes. Yeah. yeah. And so it's only going to follow here in Ontario. Scare some folks, right? Scare some where there's been a business a long time. They're going, look at if the, if, if the client knows what the sale price was and they know what things are going for, then we're going to lose business. Well, it hasn't affected people still want selling this knowledgeable in the business. They still want they still want the support of a realtor and what the realtor can give them about knowing your value and understanding what you bring to the table. It's about building relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find out a detail for this house. If you're transactional only, you're gonna be out of business in a hurry. I think so. I think so, because you don't get any repeat or referrals from being strictly transactional realtor. Right, just by getting the, the sold side or the buyer, and we see them around. We know who they are. You know, you spoken briefly about AI earlier. I think yes, AI is going to take care of those uh, transactions. Midwell puts them right out of business. Yeah, if they can't build a relationship and get that repeat business, that repeat referral. Yeah. Right, you have to, and you do that, you build trust. Right, and when when you have an elevator speech or when you have a three to five minutes in open house, it's tough to build that trust. One of the things that works is practice, right? The more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get. And then if you track your success rate, you should be trending upward, right? Where okay, now I'm only now now I'm getting now I'm adding people to my database. Like I'm adding two or three out of every five I talk to. Whereas when you start, it might be two or three out of every ten or twenty. So if you hone those skills and track it and, and you start to learn the conversations and comfort, and you and just like riding a bike, you get comfortable doing open houses if you do them regularly. They're not brand new every time. Okay, next slide, please, Joey. Watch my time here too, because if I if I mentioned it once, I mentioned it a hundred times, I might be a little chatty. So and we might get, we might, you know, we can burn through this or not. Um, so safety, circling back to safety and that, and this goes for guys too. Escape routes out of the house, right? You make sure your deadbolts are unlocked when you're in it. I mean that is, and you also leave it the way you find it. That's something else. I don't know, I don't know. I can't tell you when I first started out how many times I got halfway back to my own house with the key for the lockbox in my pocket or something because you get talking and you lock the door. And did, I, did I put it back in there? Little things like this, right? Which spins back to checklists again. If you have a checklist opening it, closing it, you're going to be better off. So safety, escape rounds, high fences, pools. If there's a pool in the backyard, you're not going to do yourself much good running back there. Most times, if it's a weekend, Sunday, there's neighbors around, there's someone cutting grass somewhere, you could, you could yell, you could scream loud enough, you're good enough. Your cell phone signal is important, though. Doing rural areas or doing doing a, a weak area, maybe with no 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 signal. And even that's kind of going the way the dodo bird with the, with the uh, 5G cells popping up all over the place. Pretty strong. Friends or family or the admin staff, right? They're there all the time. They're going to be there from open to close. Tell them, look at I'm going to check in with you when the open house is going to help us to be your rank. And the girl, I've never yet had a, any, I've been at three offices, well, two really, but I, I've never yet had a, had a admin staff say, no, don't call me then when you're done. 
you know, they, they just, they, they just, they, they, they like the calls because there's less calls. Yeah, everyone's booking online, right? So there's, they handle less stuff. So they like to be talking, you know. Uh, walk behind the guests during a tour. So yeah, and, and again, it, this doesn't matter. This is not gender specific at all. This, this, this doesn't matter. It's just common sense. I want to have eyes on anybody that's in that house. And if it's a good house in a high turnover area and there's a lot of people there, you better have a plan on how you're going to control the number of people in the house. Because that concerns sellers too, right? Well, what are you going to do if there's three couples in and you're downstairs with one and one upstairs? Say, well, okay, well, this is how I work. I work. If it's going to be that busy and you, and you get a sense it's going to be that busy, then buddy up with someone. Buddy up with someone or a mortgage agent, mortgage agent. You know, bring someone that's, uh, that's new with a, with a mortgage broker that you know, one of your contacts, and say, look, I'm sitting up now, so we're going to come by for like an hour of it, and, and at least you've got another pair of eyes out there, another professional in the house. Square off with the seller first, make sure they're aware. Say, look, I'm going to be working with, the, with the, someone else. You know, and, but again, the things to think about before it happens, before you find yourself in that situation. Maybe you want to limit the numbers in the door. Ask me to please wait on the stoop. Look, at, I say, thanks for coming by today. You know, but I'm, I'm with another client right now and I can't have too many folks. And would you mind waiting there for five minutes or so? Most people will say, sure, no problem. They may go. And if they don't, well, then great. You don't want to work with them anyways, right? It, 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 but most people will be, they're very, you know, they understand. They get it because they're homeowners themselves and they would want the same thing to be looked after. So it separates you as a realtor, Alex. It separates you because if you're that conscientious about who's in their house, you say, hey, maybe I should be working with this person and not the person I have with the hole in the sock and he's sitting, sitting on a couch, you know, like not that guy. That might not be the really good that we want. So always think about it though before it's too late and you have to think about it. That's kind of the point, right? The point is planning it and be prepared for it. Knowing the area is important too. Like, I mean, Letitia Heights and Barry 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe now, that was kind of one of the low point, lower areas, the higher risk areas to be in. It's changed now and it's, it's regentrified a little bit, so it's not quite that bad. You go down to Charlotte Street and Mary Street, if you're down there, maybe it'd be, you know, I'd probably have a vest on. You know, open house down there, that's the, the only, you know, that's where the police like to have. A certain element of the population they like that in all one area right okay next slide please joey have to be careful she might goes off no she's very good um so prospecting around open houses this is something where i was alluding to earlier door knocking around the open house right because we never know where a possible buyer may come from or another seller so you just go and you knock the neighborhood if you and you know what? It may be daunting to do 300 homes, even in a built-up city like Oshawa. You know, I'm not going to do 300. Like you say, 300, you'll never get there. But why don't you say I'm doing an open house? I'm going to do 15 homes in the area. I'll just do five on each side of the house or something. Five across the street, and that's plenty, right? Five on each side and five across the street, and build from there. In other words, do some rather than not. Do something. You go out there if you have if you want to say you know what i'm hosting an open house from one to three but i'm going to be there at 12. if you want to come by early before everyone else came by i'll be happy to, to walk you through the house here's a business card that you'll need to get in on cheap business cards there and you have a stack of them that are at least a year two three maybe four years old so i say here here take this if you give this to me on on the day that you come in i'll let you in early on, the, on whatever day you're having right a ways to engage the neighborhood because they're watching, like we don't know. The fact is, we don't know who's thinking about selling or who's not, right? So even if you, so if you have a listing up, we know that if one person lists the house, there's five or six other people on that street that are thinking about listing in any given market at any given time. So why not knock on their door? And that way, there you're demonstrating to them how hard you're working for the seller, right? So it does so many more things than just gear up for your open house. Um, Prospecting and marketing. Are you aware of the difference of those two things, Alex? You know, pros can, can you, can you, I, I would ask Brian, but I'm pretty sure he said they had a marketing history, so you'll know the difference between prospecting and marketing. Yeah, they, they are different. They sort of, they're trying to accomplish the, 
like similar goals, but in different ways. Marketing is more um, less uh, people focused and more trying to promote the uh, the property itself and prospecting is going out talking to people, engaging people about the property. So it's more FaceTime with actual humans, I would say. Okay, I would say that's kind of fair, Tara. Marketing is an expense and prospecting is Can you do that? <laughs> yeah, okay. So did you hear that okay, Alex? Can you, I should have asked that earlier on. Can you, can you hear what's being said in the background or your lip reading or? No, I, yeah, no, I can't lip read the cameras on, but I can all right, yeah. Okay, because okay, our speaker's been kind of funny. Yeah. And so, Brian, they're both kind of on the same track, on the right track, I think, right? I think, I think, I think we want to have a prospecting based marketing enhanced business, right? That's the, that's the model that works the best, at least for someone who's starting out. You can build more, you can allocate more funds to marketing and grow your, grow your brand and grow your business as you get more successful. But we play a game called red light, green light, which means like unless it's going to make make us money, we don't do it, right? Unless it's going to unless it's going to enhance our bank account value, then really we're not going to do it. So that's why we track everything fairly meticulously, and if it and and you turn it off and turn it on, right? Particularly in the market, if you're busy, if you're doing 20 deals a year, you have to kind of focus your energies and on what's what where you're getting a return. Right. Open houses are, are good. They're prospecting mostly once you have the signs. Right. And we'll talk about signs in a few minutes. But uh, but for sure, there is a difference between the two prospecting and marketing. And you want to be prospecting based marketing and tenants. OK, next slide, please. So we talked about this before, too, when you're prospecting, you're door knocking around an open house. Uh, you can also call your, your MET people. We have a MET and an unmet in our database, right? We look at we look at in terms of touching how many times we should touch uh, people that we've met to keep them in our Engaged. top of mind. Yeah, yeah. Sorry? Engaged. Engaged. Thank you very much. Used to be 33 touches a year. Most of the documentation that we have here will say 33 times a year. With the social media exploding the way it is with Instagram or TikTok, I think it's closer to 55 times a year. We should be connecting or talking with our clients 55 times a year. So if you if you think of if you think of having a database of 50 people, that's a chore by itself to make sure you're touching them all those times. And a touch doesn't have to be a phone call, right? A touch can be a touch can be a bunch of different things. But your mess, your 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 sphere, your people, you you want to keep reminding them that you're in real estate. Without telling them, without telling them that you're a realtor, right? So you, but but again, that, it sounds like a lot of touches, but it's really not. When you break it down to all the different holidays we have throughout the year, COVID was a great reason to pick up the phone and call someone you haven't talked to in three months. We also have a good database too. We have a we have a database where it goes alphabetically. Where you pick two letters a day and, and make your calls. You call all those people, right? And until you cycle through them all. Then there's their birthdays, there's their home anniversaries, there's their, hey, their open houses, how's that go, right? You can call anybody in your buyer's network and your mess that you that, that maybe have been in their home for a long time. Hey, there's a house you might be interested in, you were talking about meeting Google, this one has a pool, how about, how about you come by this Sunday? You know, you can you can lead that towards your, your open houses and generate traffic there. Because you know what, they may not be thinking about it, they might not be thinking about moving, but they may know someone that will, and that's a warm call, right? That's a warm call. It's a touch and it's saying, hey, knowing your clients and building that relationship, it takes off so many boxes and it says, you know what? Like, why don't we, why, why don't you stop by for a visit? I got coffee on it. I'll, I might have, oh, well, you like the Boston cream donuts, don't you? I, I'll make sure I have one of them. Uh, Tim Horton's Boston cream, I'll put it aside for you. You know, I'll be there for two to four. And, and then it takes a couple of boxes, you get a couple of touches, and you get some traffic for your open house. Your seller doesn't, the seller doesn't have to know that it's one of your clients that you've met before. They just see someone coming through, right? So it's all good. It's all optics. Next slide, please. Maybe I can hit it. Can I? No, I can't. Oh, no. Um, did you hit two there, Joby? Or, yeah, you did 24. It doesn't matter. So yep, mindset that's the one. Oh, it's the next one. Okay, thank you. So we talk about mindset all the time in this game, right? It's how you get up in the morning. It's what you do to start your day off. It's how you're going to get in business. 
And it's the same with open houses. The right mindset's everything. If you go in there thinking, I don't really want to do that open house. Like I'm just gonna, I know I'm gonna blow, I'm gonna blow two hours. The Jay's game's on, I'd rather watch that, right? Unless Alex knows pitching. If he's pitching, I don't want to watch it. Not this year. But uh so so if if you spend some time researching the area, research getting excited, get yourself excited about it. That excitement will be contagious. I think you'll share that excitement at the open house. Again, being cautious to temper it a bit and not scare people away. Right? Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, this one. So this one here is about visibility and about top of the mind marketing. And we know that most people can only really keep two or maybe three realtors at the top of their mind at, at any given time. So if you've got lots of signs out, and I used to, there used to be a guy in town here that did a lot. He was a Sutton agent. I'm trying to think of his name, and I can't right now, but he used to put about 10 signs up around the area that he was doing an open house. And they were just red arrows, really, with his name and, 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 and an open house. And it was effective, right? I mean, it, it, it just, it, particularly if you're if you're up against other brands, if you're up against other people, and you're and you don't do a lot of business, if you have several signs up, then get them out there. They're not expensive. You can get them made if you have to board them. Sometimes your office will have signs, right, that they'll sign out. Get it? Signs they'll sign out. There's a joke in there, but the dad joke. <laughs> so I know we used to have four or five from here, and you get as many out as you can, and, and watch your bylaws. Some some municipalities and some places they don't like signs out. They don't like the directional signs out, even the day of. Some people put them out 24 hours ahead. Some people leave them out, you know, for the next day if you're doing a Saturday Sunday. Well, it depends on the, the town too. You got to watch. Say, yeah, you, they'll still pick them up. They pay a bylaw officer to go in and pick them up at Innisfil, I think, right? And, and uh, I'm not sure about Clearview anymore. Clearview is tough too, but they do. They they have a stack of them, and you want them, you pay money to get them back. It's just, you know, it's the way it is. So know your, talk to your real estate association, your local board. They'll know the rules and read through the MLS rules for, for putting signs out. Because it can get crazy, right? You can go, you can go a bit too far one way. Okay. Uh, but it's just that if, you, if you're not doing that, uh, then you're not steering traffic towards your house. Now, you may argue that if it's in one neighborhood, that they're going to come to the house anyway. So why don't you just let, let them use other people's signs? As long as you got one outside, they're seeing signs, right? They're going to come by it. But again, it's associating you as a realtor with that house and, and being the realtor of choice. So that's what it comes down to. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, they're talking about dominant mind share there. They're talking about how you position yourself. So if you get all your signs around, even though you've got one house and your competitor has four or five, more science than your name equals more of a sense that you've got the market share, dominant mind share. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so again, again, we're talking about science. We're talking about having your science done up. Your name should be big. And, and this kind of, this is the reversal of the way it used to be. It used to be the brokerage had to be larger and your, 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 your salesperson or broker had to be smaller. And now they're kind of not reinforcing that so much. So you can see your name big. You want people to associate your name and your brand, right? As many times as possible. Okay, thanks, Joby. I think we got the point there. We get, we kind of get it. There you go. There. Date and times of open houses. There's. You can if your writing's nice and neat, you can have them. If you've got standard size, head brick it up. Saturday, Sunday, two to four, one to three, twelve to two. Whatever. I mean, it can get expensive if you start wanting to cover all bases. If you have a if you have a good marker though and a good penmanship, you can just write down the day and the time of the open house and wipe it clean at the end if you have room on your signs. Yeah, balloons are great too, right? I don't know balloons and someone else. Um, Rick, Rick, Rick. He's gone now to to Ontario. Or sorry, he's gone to New Brunswick. He used to put, you know, the whirly birds up there, the little kids, kids, uh, dollar store things that they used to win when the wind would blow them. He'd tape them to his signs and he got more traffic off them because people, it, it, it attracts the eye, right? If you, yeah, anything, balloons, I used to use yellow and red balloons or yellow and white balloons or yellow and green. Uh, you know, I don't have to tell you where I work. 
But red and white balloons, any tiny balloon whatsoever that flutters in the wind and bounces around, if you can ever buy five balloons and get five balloons tied to your signs, you're doing better than I am because I always ended up having to buy a couple extras because I was lost a couple on the way. They either get their screen goes by or someone talks me away or, you know, or they, bust in, <laughs> they bust in the trunk of your car. Like something like that's going to happen. So, again, if you can get something to, to draw a person's eye to your sign, if there's lots of signs out there and someone else is doing it great, they're going to do it for you. 10 plus signs out, I mean, that's excessive. I, I, starting out in the room, you probably don't have 10 signs, but you can borrow some. And as long as you're from your firm or they can, you know, if they're generic, the next best thing is to have all your name on it. But if you don't, then, then you just get your, your brand and your company out there and you're doing fine. Okay, next one, please, Joby. Okay, so there's an example of some generic signs, right? They're not very effective because there's no, no name on them, right? No name, no phone number, right? You want to at least have a name, phone number, because not that people call you too much off the sign, but they can take a picture of your sign if they're not naming them wrong. That's, that's the way of them getting it. Okay, next, please. So I have to laugh at local metropolitan newspapers because they're just, they're expensive and not a lot of people read them anymore. Or do they? There's still a few people. There's still a few people that look through the newspapers, and I still see John Lawler from Royal Page. He's still in the paper. I remember when Neil Bailey Hay had eight pages in there, eleven pages in the paper. You know, Peggy used to do a full page right yeah. front and back. No, she still does. Is she still doing it? Yeah. So I strong. Know, I so is it effective? Maybe it is, maybe it is. And who's going to sell their homes, right? Older folks still like a newspaper. They still, if there's a crossword, they're going to do the crossword in there. So it's a function of budget, right? And that's where it drifts into marketing and prospecting again, right? This is mail outs, email mail outs are good. Chris mentioned earlier about they send out an email and then they track, open, read, deleted without being open so that they know how effective it is. And that's the point of it all. If you do handwritten notes or anything at all at that open house, or for that open house, you're doing something. And in my experience, something, Alex, is better than nothing, right? So if you're doing something, you track it, and then you're doing something. Internet's the best one, it's so free. And then uh, your MLS, it's so it gets loaded on there free, so that's great too. Homesopentoday.com, I think that's more US based. I don't know if we have that up here or not yet. So, um, coaching and courses too. Oh, that's clipped in there. See how subliminal that is? They slip that right in there. You have to get your thinking about it. Okay, next slide, please. So there is checklists in your guide. Did you get a guide too, Brian? Did you have a? You got one, right? So, so you'll see in your guide. You'll see that there's checklists there for open houses. This is all still before. We're probably still in prep mode. Okay, next, um, next slide, please. So this is during, this is what we talk about, what you say during, and we've already covered some of this too, so we'll just, we'll zip through this probably. Uh, Joby, please, next slide. Quality leads is great, right? Like you can buy leads now and it irks me that, it irks me that we're buying our own leads that are gleaned off the Korea website. So we pay for the website to be set up. And I don't know how many times I get phoned during a week by someone trying to sell me leads. And I was asked, are you a realtor? Uh, no, we're a company. We just so you're 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 um, enhanced. You're you're encouraging the completion of a trade in real estate by giving me leads, right? How are you getting these leads? Anyways, it just you should shut them up. <laughs> no, I was just saying I get them at least three, four times. So it's it's irritating, right? And it's they're trying to sell me leads. Well, the often the times the big megas have bought up all the great leads anyway. So you're getting you're getting lousy leads, I think. And then there's the ones that say don't pay for anything until you actually do a deal, and then they'll shave a percent off, right? Whatever five percent or ten percent, whatever they're asking for. So I, maybe I'm old, but I can resi I resist those the urge to buy leads. I just I just you know I don't find that those leads are very good. They're you know they're. They're no, they're not qualified leads. They're cold leads. Or someone clicked. Someone clicked on a site somewhere, and that's whose name you're getting, right? So, the consensus here, anyways, Alex, seems to be: save your money, buy yourself a case of beer, and forget about forget about buying leads. Like I mean, I, I just and I know the big players do it because they feel their competitors are doing it, and they want to have a chance that if there are any good leads out there, they want them. 
So if they've got if you when you get a two million dollar marketing budget in your in your in your economic model, fill your boots or your budget model. Go ahead, go ahead and buy as many leads as you want. But for 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 most of us that are playing red light, green light, <laughs> it's a big red light for me to buy leads. Um, so this is supposed to be a group discussion. But again, we talked a little bit about what kinds of questions do we ask to build that trust, right? And I think my one of my most successful means of, 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 of getting people to lower their shields and start talking is when I ask them exactly what they're looking for. Like, what what are you after here today? What's your what's your objective? Are you looking to buy the house? Are you looking to see what's out there? Are you, and and then get them to talk, and then just kind of be quiet and and and. Sometimes, at least for me, I have to count to five in my head, right? That was really slowly, or else I want to jump in there and feel that silence. And and, and so I count to, I count to five in my head: thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. And then they'll speak, whether it's the husband or the wife, or the husband or husband or wife or wife, whatever whatever the combination is, they will eventually say something, right? And that's where you start to get information that you can build on. You start to get a nugget of information. Maybe it's their dog's name. Maybe it's their child's name. Maybe it's we don't we don't like this entrance way, right? Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. What don't you like about it? Right? I bought the flowers today. What don't you like about the what don't you like about the entrance way? And so then, whether they're a buyer or a seller, it starts as a trickle. And then it and then it starts to flow a little bit more, and you try and connect the dots, and work off of them and build off of them. Same as your door knocking, Alex. Right? It's the same thing. If you're in an area and you're on a street, and something happens, you where you get some information, then you add it to your list. That oh, hey, I was at the Apple Street today, and I and, and they said their dog's name was Fido, right? And so you the next time you're in the area. Hey, how's Fido doing? Oh, we have to put a guy where I see you know. That's 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 what happens to Dad sometimes. But but you you make the connection, and then all of a sudden there's a bit of trust being built up, right? There's a bit of there's a, just a bit of connection, you know. Maybe what drew you to the house is a great question. What what drew you to the neighborhood? Oh oh, it's near the pool. It's near the outdoor pool, or it's near the ghost station. Is that important to you? How is that important to you? Mr. and Mrs. Meyer, how's it being close to the ghost station? What's that mean? What does that do to your life? And it gives them an opportunity to open a bit and share, right? And then that's how you build the rapport. We won't do the group discussion. There's only three of us here, unless you guys want to. If you want to go ahead and do this, we can. Something I just uh, always like to share. Sorry. Um, am I okay to go? Go ahead, please. Sorry. One thing I always like to do um, is I always try to listen to what they're not saying, because that gives you often just as much of an idea about what they're thinking as what they are saying, sometimes even more so than what they are saying, because sometimes they, they just tell you what you want to hear. So I find, and a lot of people just ignore that second half of, I guess, listening, because you know, there's nothing to listen to, but exactly why aren't they speaking about something there's a reason for that and i find if you can if you can figure that out and you can speak to it yourself then they're like putty in your hands their shields are down they'll talk to you about anything this guy gets me so I always try and listen for what they're not saying it's awesome thanks alex that's that's a great point yeah and, and you can match their there's a whole there's a whole other class on this but really quickly, you can match the pace of their talking. You can you can match and mirror their body language, so that so that you're giving them subconscious clues to get comfortable quicker, right? There's all kinds of ways to do that. There's all kinds of embedded questions and and ways to ask them and and, and to pause and to uh, the more you can match them in verbiage whether it's their language level or or or, or what the, what they're doing their body language the more likely you are to be to get even more information from them that's great okay next slide please Joby. um 
so we we talked back again about open houses. It's funny this thing seems to be a theme here today. Consistency, right? If you're doing it, try and do it the same all the time, then people will start to see. You may see the same people at different open houses, right? If they're, yeah, you might. If they in today's world where they they miss out on uh, on offers or they miss out on places. Scripts is important to internalize. We have some scripts at the end of this, and 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 you're welcome to. I, I highly suggest you either practice them or you do them yourself. But because it allows us to focus on again that buyer in there and what they're actually doing, instead of if we're having to reach for words and we're having to think about what we're trying to say, we're taking away from our ability to pick up on what they're doing, right? Especially if you got two of them in there and then you're trying to watch them both and you're trying to talk to them and show them the house and remember everything, it can be hard if you haven't internalized those scripts. Uh, written goals, written down what your expectations are for the open house is important. And again, what your guests are looking for, that's the main thing, right? It comes to understanding them. Okay, next next slide, please. Yeah, we talked about this quite a bit. The uh, the Ford process, right, which is family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. If you follow those questions and you use the open-ended questions, what, where, when, why, and who, open that up and you'll find more about them. And people do love to talk about themselves. They really do. Once you get them going, once you can open that floodgate up, be careful for that for that lonely lady that goes down the street, but they, they will they will get going and talk about them. Um, and, and a lot of the times, like you said, it's it's a matter of not rushing right away and, and getting into their space when they come in the door, letting them browse a bit, let them get comfortable with it. Because if they've pulled up to the they pulled up to the house and they've gotten out of the car, they're already interested in it. And people determine whether or not the house is going to work for them very, very quickly. Nanoseconds, actually. But if they're in the entranceway, in the first five to eight seconds, they know whether or not the house is going to work. Now, they'll go through the motions and just get in and get out of it. But but if they're in there, the longer you keep them in there, the better it is. It's like, you know, when that car salesman says, yeah, take the car, keep it overnight. Take it for a test drive. They know. The longer that you're in there, the more that you're going to bomb it. So it's the same with homes, right? They're trying the home on when they come into it. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, as, as you get more better at it, your skills get get enhanced. You'll you'll figure out who's there to look for a house and who's just who's the who's the, the looky loo or they or you know the nosy neighbor. You're going to find that out pretty quickly, but sometimes you're wrong, right? Like, I mean, if you hone that skill of that instinct, then you'll be, you'll be doing good. Um, yeah, it's commonsensical stuff. When they tour the house, we want to tell them you want to focus on the positive. Have you been in an open house? Or if you, if you walk around and do them, you'll see agents that point out the negative points of the house, right? They just do it thinking that they're doing themselves a favor, but they're not. The, the, the buyer will find that out eventually anyway. Don't don't focus on that negative stuff. Focus on anything positive that you have about that. Look how bright it is. Even the dark day in here, look how bright it is in the house. And we got and we got four 200 watt bulbs on and look how bright it is. It's beautiful. Okay, next slide, please. So the capture, right? Fortune is in the follow-up, folks. I mean, I mean, whatever you're talking about, it's 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 if you get the lead and you don't do anything with it, then you might as well you might as well not even have gotten there at all, right? You have to give them, ask them what they're after, what they're looking for. Clearly, we want to ask them if they're working with another agent, if they're signed under contract with that other agent, right? I think I mentioned that earlier. See if you can do a CNA for them, a quick CNA even. They're quick and easy. Say, are you interested? Are you neighbor here? Hey, you know what? On the way home, I can you know I can stop by and have a quick look. I'll be happy to do a CNA. All I can say is no. If you don't ask, we don't get something else. My mom used to say to me all the time. So again, once you've got that, once you've got their shields down a little bit, they may be receptive to that. I've done that. I've even picked up a pistol before, like a, a, a concrete, a concrete. And she, I, she said, "I'm already starting to have a concrete." I came by. I told her what I thought. I gave her the. I gave her my CMA, and it was okay. Is it breach? Was I a breach of contract? Well, I, you know what? She ended up when that contract ended, then we signed and I listed her house. Right? Just because we built that relationship. Right? 
telling a guest book. Yeah, you can call it a guest book. I mean, I think I think if the more respect you have for some of the buyers and sellers coming through your open house, the better off you'll be, because the, clearly this isn't the only house you're ever going to look at. So they've been others, and they they're getting a sense for what's working well and what's not working well for them. So so get them to sign up for you. Ask them if it's okay. You know, we're not allowed to spam them. We have regulations, and we tell them that. But they hear that from everyone else. So what you want to try and do is separate yourself from what they're going to hear from everyone else. Right? Okay. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can always ask them to be blunt and say, you can buy this house? Do you want to buy this house today? You know, like, you know. And usually they'll laugh or they'll say, well, we have to think about it. We have to talk to someone so over, you know. So that's when you can be opened up the door crack and you say, well, I got this for you, you know, here, you click this QR code, I'll send the other houses that are similar to this one. And, you know, tell me what you like and don't like. And then if they're out there looking, funny the way the universe works at times, right? When someone starts to look for a house, they start to hang around other people that are looking for a house. Or when someone's thinking about listing their house, they just start to talk to other people that are thinking about listing and moving to. And that, that, that works time and time again. So ask them, and, and, and you know, again, it, we think that, oh, well, if you just met me in open house, they're never going to want to, you know, they won't agree to anything or tell me anything. Fact of the matter is, guys, we don't know what someone's going to say or not going to say until we ask them. If we don't ask them, we'll never know. You may get, you may get 99 no's, but then you'll get that one person who, who likes you and likes the way you are and goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I would like to, to, to you know, think about an offer in this house and what that would look like, right? So I would like to talk more, even if they just want to talk more and, and meet for a coffee. You've you, you've done something at that open house, right? Okay, next please. Right. So we're talking about appointment. We're always closing for an appointment. Close, 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 close. Um, again, if you're too early, you'll know it. They'll tell you their body language. Will tell you when you're when you're. So did you want? Do you want to have a cup of coffee? Or do you want? Is it okay if I come by this afternoon? When I lock up, I've got nothing else to do at five. You'll know. You'll say no, no, I'm not thinking about it. No. So that's a trial close, right? That's a, that's an attempt. So then, okay, we didn't get it. So then follow up. If you get their information, that's a good piece to have, right? You get something that you can send later on. If you, something came up in the conversation, you made a note of it. It's not too busy in open house. You've made a note of that. You're going to follow up. You're going to hit that note. You're going to you're going to let them know that you're listening to them, and that helps to build trust as well. Um, so let's say you're getting one of those quiet open houses on that property that's been up for six months that no one's ever come by. It's got cobwebs everywhere, right? We've been there. Don't waste that time. You can use that time productively. You can write some write some banking notes up. I have written notes. I'm still a big I'm still a big fan of them. I still find them good because people like to get mail that's not a, got a window in it, right? They like an envelope that doesn't that's not a bill. So if they just say, hey, you know what? You dropped by my open house last week. I just wanted to drop a note and say thanks. You know, if you need anything, here's my card. You can put a card in there if you want. It's not too forward. Again, it's our ego that gets in the way. It's what we think someone's going to say that slows us down a lot of times. So say it anyways. And like, try it anyways. You know, I mean, I lost the listing presentation one time. I sent them a thank you note anyway. This is, uh, I used to send thank you notes like before I even went on the, the uh, listing presentation. Just thanks for your time. It's going to be a pleasure working with you, blah, blah, blah. So I did that. I lost the listing presentation to a competitor. It didn't work out with the competitor. I got the phone call. Dan, come with my house. Thanks. And it was a neighbor. It was only, and it was like, I don't know if it was that card that did it, but you just don't know until you do something like that. So you can always find time, use your time productively. Heck, if the worst thing you do at an open house is pick off your continuing education courses, you're doing something. And I've done that too, right? Like on a quiet day, on a, on a nice, on a long weekend, long weekends are always a coin toss. If I was going to say no to hosting an open house on, on a weekend, any day of the week or any day of the year, it would probably be on like a Labor Day weekend or it would be on a Thanksgiving Day weekend. Because because even buyers like to take a break and they, they, they even at those times, they even, even they will, will not, right? But that would be, you know, I mean, it depends on how hungry I am. <laughs> if I don't have anything, I'll say, all right, I'll do it. Because it's, it's a coin toss. I really don't know what kind of traffic you're going to get. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, only 450 more slides to go, and we're done, guys. So we're doing good. 
Um, scripts for conversations. Yeah, the scripts are there. They're in your packages. I'll tell you what, they will do nothing for you if you don't practice them. If those scripts stay in there and you're not talking to them in the mirror, you're not going through them with a buddy, with an accountability person, you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna get any better at internalizing. You can read them, but you, you got to use them, right? Use it or lose it. Um, next slide, please. I think we've done this one too. We can go ahead and do it if you want. I I think we're fine with this one actually. We talked about some key scripts. We've actually you know we've almost done it. I had a room full of folks who'd be breaking up now and you'd be doing it. I'd be listening to you work through it because again it benefits in the doing. Right. Uh, so your scripts are there, your qualifying scripts. Now the fortune is in the follow-up. I'll say it again. The fortune is in the what? The follow-up. This is where people drop the ball. And you know what? They may not answer you the first time you talk to them. So you might meet someone in an open house and they might they might just blow you off second, third. In fact, most North Americans are wired to blow you off four times. They will sing all four. So you have to figure out four different ways to ask them. So maybe the email that you sent them you never heard back from. So you make a phone call, you leave a message. Yeah, you leave a message. Then maybe you do a handwritten note. Maybe it's the follow-up email that, you know, I tell people there's two times to stop stop calling a client or a prospect. Time number one is your, their name in the obituaries, right? You see that they passed on. They likely won't get back to you then. And if they do get back to you, then you've got a problem. Because then, because then they're coming through the supernatural. The second time you say no is when you get a cease and desist order from the police. That's a good time. That's a good time to stop calling them. That's a good time to say, okay, they really don't want to hear from them anymore, right? Other than that, again, if you drive by their house and they've got a competitor sign in the ground, you have to back off again for con contractual purposes, right? But until they're until they're under contract with someone else, or until they're dead, or until the police call you, don't stop. Don't stop talking to them because you just never know. Maybe they're busy. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a no. It's not right now, right? Some folks aren't good about getting back to you. Some folks don't want to communicate all the time. But if they need you, and if you keep keep knocking on the on their window, then they'll. You might just time it right where they have that argument with their spouse in the morning. You know, the next thing you know, they're and you happen to land in there. It's like, you know what? We are thinking about selling. Why don't you come by? We don't know. So follow up with your database, your personals, your Mets, your 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 guests from the from the open house. That follow up is a key. Other agents to come in. They're going to give you a card because they got a whole drawer full of them too that they're trying to get rid of, right? So you want to take that card. Don't throw it out. Talk to them and build a relationship with that other agent because you know why? The agents retire too. And if you've got a good relationship with an agent, you can put your company or not, guys. We've got to be nonpartisan around here. We have to be at the point where we're beyond that. We're, we're here to increase the, 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 the value to the consumer of the business, right? We're here to do the best we can to help our clients out. And if I know someone else some, that, that can help me do that, I'm going to do that, right? Okay. Next slide, please, Joby. Okay, so yeah, this is this is again something we've been talking about. Just don't know. Could be buyers who buy with you, sellers who list with you, people that you haven't met waiting to be waiting to be meeting with you. Agents could be recruited, yeah, recruited, that's a big word, yeah. Um, or any of the above who may refer business to you. Thank you. Next. So number one market agent, again, we talked about this earlier too. We don't all aspire to be number one, but we all want to be the best that we can be individually. So I would I would change that a little bit to say, instead of being the number one realtor, how about being the best man I can be? And I don't even have to do it overnight. I can do it 1% a day, right? Regularly and continuously so that there's improvement there and then we're, we're a bit better today than I was yesterday. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, next. <laughs> We're talking about QR codes. Isn't that great, huh? Almost like you've seen this presentation before. Imagine that. Um, can we back up to that QR code? I want to see what it is. See if it works on this. Is that the, just the market center? Oops. Let's try to it's like it's 
Canterbury University. Is that what it is? Ah, uh, okay, that's it. Yeah, don't worry about the evaluation. Yeah, that's only if I was a serious facilitator and wanted to become faculty. Then you, you track these evaluations and then it's a long process and uh, I'm not there yet. I've got some ahas to do. Okay, so some things that we should be taking away from here. If it's not written down, it doesn't exist, right? So if, if you don't have a plan for hosting an open house or doing it next time, then then you'll have probably blown away the last almost two hours now of your time. So so make it make it a plan then by a certain date and, and you attach to, to make it goal specific, you have to have a date and a time that you're gonna have it done. So what I suggest to you to do is whatever you use for a day timer or a plan, write in what you're gonna do, when you're gonna do your next open house and what you're gonna do to prepare for it. If you do those two things, you're gonna be further ahead than, than a lot of other people, right? And then have an action plan around that. Okay, well, I'm gonna get a checklist. You might not know the area or the house yet, but you can do things, you can, you can formulate your questions, you can organize your thoughts, you can, you can start to build on it. And then your lead generation action planning worksheet. That's uh, we have something called a 411. It's a, it's a day timer, electronic, and it's and it's and it's paper, whatever people prefer. And it's designed to get you focusing on what's important to get you where you want to go. Right. And they're all different. They say number one in the market, in the market share, be number one. Be the best person you can be, right? Do the best job you can. Okay. Anyone have, do you have any questions? Any, Alex, do you have any questions? Um, just one. Uh, I'm a little bit virtual today, so I didn't get the uh, the handout package, or I, what I assume is the handout package. Any chance I could get that emailed to me? You sure can. Yeah, and if you if you get Joby your email, she'll forward it to me. Okay. So you can look in the chat, and she'll Will copy do. it and forward it to me if you, if you don't mind. I'd be happy to do that for you. I appreciate it. It's coming shortly. Okay. There's Joby's smiling face again. Thank you, Joby, for your help. I think we're pretty much done. These are the concrete steps you can take. That's your time blocking. So when we say action plan, we want things to be in step with our life goals, right? And, and I know there's a three year, five year, and a Sunday plan. And I'm just talking about it. Folks have heard about it before and, and, and not done anything about it. But what you want to do is, is sit down with your significant other or if you're by yourself, if you're schizophrenic, great, sit down with all four or five of you in that's me. But I mean, sit down and just, even if you do not do separate sheets of paper, you say, what do I want to be someday? What are my someday goals? Then you hammer it down to five years, three years, and one year. Then you have a, an overall game plan, right? This is what I want to be. This is what I want to do when I do X. Then you break down your daily work days to help you get there so that you're in line. Now that may change as we change and grow older and all, we're, all of us are only one phone call away from a doctor really, that'll really change our really change our world. But at least you have something you're working towards and you're not just going through the motions, right? And I think that's important. And so we talk a lot about that and we talk a lot about time blocking, time blocking lead generation. Lead generation doesn't have to be door knocking. It doesn't have to be doing open houses. It can be a combination of all of them, right? But we time block for a purpose. We time block to get somewhere we want to go. And again, that can change, right? Life changes. Life is funny that way. Um, block off that time. Protect that time. Because distractions are, 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 are commonplace, right? Oh, the phone rings up. The email goes. But if we program ourselves to... And if, even if you can't do three hours a day, we can only do an hour. Get that in there and do that hour. And then if you're doing five things, and I'll finish up on this, I know we're getting close. And you've been listening to me, you've been very patient listening to me for a long time, and I thank you for that. I'll give you five things you should be doing every day to be a successful realtor. Thing number one is lead generating, right? We know that. Thing number two is lead follow-up. Follow up on those leads, the fortunes and the follow-up. The third thing you want to do is book appointments and go on appointments. You have to hone your skills. So you want to do appointments. The fourth thing is negotiate contracts, right? Whether it's for the buyer or the seller, you want to be talking to people about your contracts. And the fifth thing, in no order of importance, scripts and role play every day. Work on scripts, internalize your scripts, 
get comfortable talking about them with your colleagues because hey let's get if you're going to mess up and trip over your tongue wouldn't you rather do it with a colleague than you would with a client i mean the average price of a home in there is what seven hundred eighteen thousand dollars in fact it's july 15th or something so that commission on that even if you negotiate and you would go all the way down to one and a half points or, or, or one one percent even one percent of that that's a significant chunk of change i'd rather trip up my over my tongue right here with colleagues than i would in front of a client right given the choice so those five things if you do those five things every day you will be successful in real estate you'll, and you'll make it through down markets and challenging markets does anyone have any thoughts as we wrap up then? Is there another slide? I should, I should probably make sure that, we're, that we truly are at the end. So thank you. Don't worry about the uh, evaluation. Um, yeah, just uh, any thoughts? Any final thoughts? No, thank you. No, you're welcome. Brian? I've written down those five things that I think that was pretty important. Okay, thank you very much for that. Alex? Uh, no, just uh, thank you. Really appreciate, really appreciate okay. it. Well, I appreciate you guys taking the time, making the time to come here. And I know I spent probably too much time talking because I'm a little dry. So, and that happens. That's that's me. That's got nothing to do with you guys. Um, watch for it, though. I will be opening up scripts and role play. It'll either be it'll be in the morning. It'll be on a Zoom session. You won't have to be in here, but it'll be hybrid, and it'll probably be for half an hour from eight to eight thirty. Monday to Friday, time to be to be established. So clearly, Brian, you have a connection with with David. So watch for it. He's gonna he'll shock me and tell you when it's up. We did a we did a soft lunch in July and it was bumpy. I think it was on holidays, right? And so so it was bad. Like, no, in September. I hope to. Yeah, you will yeah. be participating. Both my girls will be in school for the oh. first time. Well, so I have like. So you're time blocking that time then right now. For so, yeah, I'll just, yeah, we'll have to just, because our school starts so late. Yeah. 9.30. Wow. Yeah, it's very late. Can you send them out the door, son? <laughs> 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 I have a TV going and then breakfast. I can yeah. get away for half an hour. Awesome. Well, okay, guys, thanks for coming out. Let's watch for it. I know uh, quite a few folks from Energy uh, were attending this, the role plays before in scripting. So, so watch for it to pop up. And if you've got time in the morning, if we talked about mindset there a few minutes ago, it's a great way to start your day off and to get your head thinking about business anyways. You know, there is a participation medal award during that one though. So you'll have to be ready to, you'll have to be ready to jump in the script. Thanks again for stopping by. Joby, thank you so much for everything. Have a great night. Bye. Bye guys. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Bye. Welcome to play.